thanks for being interested in plants and nature. And I want to remind you that none of us got to where we are without being helped, without some guidance. Accordingly, I ask that you take a moment now and during this event to reflect on those individuals and organizations who helped develop your passion and your knowledge and encourage you likewise to share the experience. One of the greatest influencers regarding botany is Robert H. Molenbrock. With assistance from Mike Moya, who is one of the long list of Robert H. Molenbrock disciples, I am pleased and we are honored to have Dr. Molenbrock officially welcome and address us today via video message. I am Dr. Robert H. Molenbrock. I am the person who has retired from an academic botanical career of 34 years and I'm in my second botanical career of 32 years and counting. It is a great pleasure to be able to address this group of Carex enthusiasts. I have to speak to you via video since I physically could not make the trip to Bloomington. But as you will find out shortly, that hasn't completely slowed me down. In my career, I attended very few professional meetings, but early in my career, I attended a couple of national meetings. To be honest, I was usually bored stiff. I kept thinking what all I could be accomplishing if I were out in the field or back in the herbarium. I want to give the highest praise to Paul Rothrock for his two magnificent volumes on the sages of Indiana and adjacent states. I regret that I have not had the opportunity to meet Paul in person. I learn a lot when I read Paul's books. For example, I found out for the first time that Eliacris Bella occurred in Illinois. Even before Paul's books were published, I learned from Paul how to distinguish Carex albolutescens from Carex longii. In my first edition of Carex of Illinois, I had confused these two species. One of my students told me that Paul Rothrock had explained how the two species really differ. My second edition got it right, finally, thanks to Dr. Rothrock. <laughs> I have had a satisfying and exciting career. I taught classes for 64 consecutive years, and I have had publications every year for 70 years and counting. Just five years ago to the day, at the age of 85, I was standing in the middle of a fen in West Chicago, excitedly teaching adults how to identify wetland plants. My enthusiasm began when I was a senior in high school. Miss Smith wanted me to locate every tree species in Southern Illinois. I was using a book entitled Native and Naturalized Trees of Illinois written in 1927 by Miller and Tihon. In the book was mentioned that yellowwood trees grew near Olive Branch in extreme Southern Illinois. No one seemed to have heard of this tree in Illinois. So my dad took me to Olive Branch and we did discover the yellowwood trees. I was thrilled. Miller and Tihon also mentioned a second group of shortleaf pines in Illinois from a place called Piney Creek. Many of us knew of the shortleaf pine in the Pine Hills, but no one knew of any other native shortleaf pines in Illinois. Again, my dad took me to Piney Creek. Not only did we rediscover shortleaf pines there, but I found my first state records, Bradley Spleenwort, Harvey's Buttercup, Inland Bluegrass, and Inslin's Blackberry. How exciting for a senior in high school to find four state records. In my case, the discovery of new records and remarkable natural areas and sharing these with 90 graduate students is what has spurred me on. I went on to discover more than 50 Illinois state records. But most remarkably, although unable to get out into the field, I discovered two state records from my car window in 2021, just last year. Since April of 2021, shortly after my soulmate of 65 years passed away, 
My youngest son, Trent, drives me on back roads in the Shawnee National Forest each Wednesday so I can continue to enjoy nature. I found the inventive boreal dandelion, Taraxicum palustre, in full fruit on April 18 in a roadside ditch. And on November 28, I found the native large flowered beggar's tick, Bidens levis, in full flower in a deep swamp. Both of these species are new to Illinois. I began teaching week-long wetland plant identification classes for the Wetland Training Institute one week after I retired from SIU. I did this for 27 years, teaching 328 wetland classes in 32 different states. Being in the field five days a week for these 27 years gave me a chance to study wetland plants, including Carex, and I became pretty proficient in doing so. In my second edition of my Sedges of Illinois, published in 2011, I recognized 195 species of Carex in Illinois. Because of my competitive nature, I secretly wanted Illinois to surpass Michigan, the Carex leader, in the number of species of Carex. I was accused by one of my students that the reason I split some species of Carex into two different species was to increase the number of species of Carex in Illinois. No, the reasons I split granularis into granularis and haliana, amphibola into amphibola and corrugata, and crinida into crinida and gynandra were because I had seen all of these complexes several times in the wetland classes I taught and I could see the differences. I now list 200 species of Carex in Illinois, and I'm trying to find out a few more I can split into two. What's the status of plant taxonomy today? I am one of the last of the golden age of Linnaean botanists, where morphology is a major consideration in classification. Who is to say that the inflorescence is a cyme, a corum, or a thirst? is less important than other characteristics in classification, or that the position of the ovules is less important. In my fourth edition of Field Guide to the Vascular Floor of Illinois in 2014, I wrote the following in the preface, quote, while the phytochemists have data that may be interpreted as showing relationships among groups that we have not considered in the past, Phytochemistry is only one of many tools and cannot replace the study of morphological features. I have been studying plants in the field for more than 60 years, 70 now, identifying them by the morphological features each plant exhibits. The phytochemical characters are not usable in the field and leave one with the distinct impression that the new system based on these characters is not consistent with morphological studies. This book of mine reflects the traditional relationships that have evolved from George Bentham to Ingram Pronnell to John Hutchinson to Arthur Cronquist. It is gratifying to look at plants to know what they are and to give them their correct names. To me, each plant is to be approached more as a friend with a set of features I recognize, not as a group of mysterious acting molecules." End of quote. After all of the chromosomes have been counted and all of the DNA has been analyzed, it is the way that plants look, their morphology, that we must not forget about. What is the purpose of plant taxonomy? Is it phylogeny or a practically useful field tool? I am aware of the APG's attempt to change classification based only on their studies. I'm not belittling the phytochemist's important contributions to botany, but without any consideration of the morphology, this is blatantly ignorant and just downright wrong. I know very few of these people, but the ones I do know cannot identify most plants in the field. I suspect they cannot even tell their asters from their button bushes. 
Have these people ever seen these plants in nature? Putting lookalikes such as in Lernia and Gradiola into two separate families, cramming Calitrica, Hepturus, and Chaloni in the same family, and putting Mimulus in the same family as Phryma are unconscionable to me. I will not merge Dodecathion into Primula. I will not put Viburnum and Sambucus in the Adox ACE. I can imagine little monotypic five inch tall Adoxamo Chatelina up in Joe Davis County, Illinois, shuddering when it learned that 200 big old woody Viburnums and nearly 50 woody Sambucuses were going to join her family, the Adox ACE. I will not be part of the group that annihilates the Scrotulary ACE. If one studies Francis Pennell's historic monograph of this family written in 1935, his description of the family is broad enough to include many genera, all based on their morphology. I have bought a larger than usual burial plot in the Pleasant Grove Cemetery. After my demise, I will have plenty of room to turn over in my grave many times. I may be in trouble for writing and saying what I've just done. But what can be done to me? I can't be fired. I can't be denied tenure. And I don't think my 796 publications can be unpublished. I am working on my fifth edition of Field Guide to the Vascular Floor of Illinois. When it comes out in a few years, it will look very much like the fourth edition because it will still recognize the traditional families. In fact, it will look very much like the first edition as well. I have a lot of common sense, but I do not consider myself a man of wisdom. But I would like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. In my opinion, I am successful because I worked hard with long hours and I believed in what I was doing. I had a companion, my dear wife, Beverly, who also believed in what I was doing. And she encouraged me and worked with me side by side every year, just as I did for her artistic creations. Whatever I do, I always try to pursue excellence, and you should too. I know I have exceeded my time this morning, but at the age of 90, I have exceeded my time there also. I wish all the best and success to each of you in the audience. Thank you for listening to me.